Okay, welcome everybody. We, we have a really great session here. It's really a celebration. It's a celebration of a, a brilliant, timely new book uh, and, and a time for us to have a, a really important discussion about what's going on in a critical region of the world. And of course, the, the, the star of today's performance is the author of that great new book, Michael Oslin, who is a tremendous historian, a scholar of contemporary Asia, and he's the Payson J. Treat Distinguished Fellow here at Hoover. He's also a great friend. Misha, really, really, it's wonderful for us to all be with you to, to celebrate this, uh, this tremendous new book. The book is Asia's New Geopolitics. And, and the book is an important book and an important time about the reshaping that's going on ac across the Indo-Pacific region. Misha is also the author of another tremendous book right behind me here uh, called The End of the Asia Century. You know, Misha is one of the most prolific and lucid analysts on what's going on in the region. And if you haven't already done it, just do what I did and set up a Google alert for whenever Misha's essays are published. You'll, you'll get them right away. He also is the host of a wonderful podcast that he does with John Yu on the Pacific Century. And of course, the Asia Pacific region, as we can see to, just today, <laughs> has so many developments ongoing, uh, whether it's from North Korea or the latest aggressive actions of the Chinese Communist Party. So we couldn't have really a more timely discussion about a vitally important region. And then, and then joining us to, to facilitate this discussion is a brilliant scholar in her own right, Dr. Nadia Shadlow, who's a visiting fellow here at Hoover and is a senior fellow at the, at the Hudson uh, Institute. And as Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy in the Trump administration, Nadia was instrumental in affecting what I think was, was probably the most significant shift in American foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. And that's the recognition that China is, is a strategic rival and that the policies of the Chinese Communist Party pose a very significant threat, not just to the United States and our interests in the region and globally, really, but to all free and, and open societies. Nadia, it's great, great to have you here to facilitate this discussion. And to kick it all off, we have Congressman Mike Gallagher, uh, who has just done a, a wonderful job serving his country uh, as, as a congressman from the 8th District of Wisconsin. Prior to, to being a congressman, which he began his, his duties there on, on Capitol Hill in 2016, he served his country with distinction as a United States Marine Corps officer. Mike has a distinguished background as a scholar as well. He's a graduate of Princeton. He has a master's and a PhD in international relations from Georgetown University. And Mike, I'll just say, you know, it's, I have fond memories of when we first met when I recruited Lieutenant Gallagher to serve on an important mission as you had just returned from Iraq. And of course, like in everything you did, you exceeded, exceeded all expectations. Mike, as you will soon learn, if you don't know already from his introductory remarks, is emerging, I think, as one of the most thoughtful young leaders in the areas of, of foreign policy, national security, uh, and intelligence. So I'd like to call on, on Congressman Gallagher. Could you please kick us off? Well, thank you, HR, thank you, HR, for that kind thank introduction, you. and thank you to Misha for asking me to join you this afternoon. Uh, as HR mentioned in a previous life, when I was in uniform, I worked for him. Uh, and so uh, if, you, if you see me break out in a cold sweat at any point uh, during these remarks, it's because I still feel like a second lieutenant whenever I hang <laughs> around HR, and I get very nervous around him. And I can hear his voice booming in, in my head, Mike, brother, you got to hurry up. I should also note that HR hurried me, uh, hired me back then because I was a Middle East specialist. So uh, in many ways, I've been catching up uh, on Indo-PACOM, and Misha's work and scholarship has been a critical part of that. Uh, and there is much in his compelling and thought-provoking new book uh, that, we should, that I look forward to talking about today. And as HR writes in his foreword, Misha has been warning of the Chinese Communist Party's increasingly belligerent behavior but it's only for a long time, but it's only been in the past few years that these warnings have become mainstream. And I've spent a great deal of time in Congress wondering why exactly that's the case. Why did it take us so long to wake up? And what is it about the present moment that has awakened the Western world to the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party? And so in search of answers, and because we've you know, been trapped in, in our, our various basements uh, during the last few months, I recently sat down and I watched the 2017 classic film, Wolf Warrior II, the highest grossing Chinese film of all time. 
And for those of you who are fans of this film, uh, you'll note that at the film's climax, the antagonist, who is an American mercenary named Big Daddy, is about to kill the hero, who's a former PLA special ops soldier named Lang Feng. And as Big Daddy attempts to jam a knife into Lang Feng's throat, he gloats and he says, people like you will always be inferior to people like me. So get used to it. Get effing used to it. Spoiler alert, Lang Feng turns the tables around and brutally stabs Big Daddy to death with the bullet he was wearing as a necklace. This is the same bullet Big Daddy used years before to kill Lang Feng's fiance. Sorry, if you haven't watched the movie, I just ruined it for you. But for fans of the original 2015 Wolf Warrior, this was a satisfying, if familiar, ending because that first installment ended with another American mercenary, this time an ex-US Navy SEAL with a British accent named Tomcat. And after trading multiple stab wounds, Tomcat manages to pin a seemingly helpless Lang Fang and while holding a Bowie knife to his throat, he rips a patch off his shoulder with a Chinese flag and the words that say, I fight for China, and he mocks him for being willing to die for his country. But of course, the tables are turned yet again and he met our hero Lang Fang manages to stab and kill Tomcat with his own knife. And shortly thereafter, the commanding general, of the Chinese unit subtly sums up the movie's message by saying, those who challenge China's resolve will have no place, safe place to hide. I think there's a lot to dissect in these <laughs> movies that may seem like an even more cartoonish version of a Michael Bay movie here in America. And in his chapter on the new China rules, Misha offers an observation that I think could be ripped straight from a wolf warrior fight scene. He says, quote, with China's new strength has come a bare knuckle abusiveness, often combined with an unexpected sense of insecurity. And it seems increasingly clear that Beijing expects the West to change how it thinks and acts, engage in self-censorship, and even punish our own workers for offending China. And of course, we've seen this phenomenon play out in spades as the CCP and its diplomats have adopted wolf warrior diplomacy throughout the coronavirus crisis, responding to General Secretary Xi's desire for them to display more fighting spirit. And in practice, wolf warrior diplomacy has produced scenes often as ham-handed and unintentionally comical as those in the wolf warrior movies. And while we're still in the middle of this plot, early returns in public opinion suggest that wolf warrior diplomacy may be backfiring in Europe in particular, and further turning public opinion against the party. But I would submit it might be popular domestically within China. And what we're seeing today is the product of recent events colliding with a long running current. And that's of course the CCP's cover up of the coronavirus outbreak and its subsequent wolf warrior attitude that have won it few fans abroad. And at the same time, the wolf warrior attitude is not exactly brand new. Remember, the first movie came out in 2015 and indeed two American administrations in a row across both political parties have released defense strategies that rightfully prioritize the Indo-Pacific, but none with the urgency and the actual strategic sense that HR and Nadia put together. And I give them incredible credit for the phenomenal work that was done in the 2017 national security strategy leading to the subsequent national defense strategy. And I just would tell you as someone who works on these issues every single day in Congress, at a time when the country is very politically divided, I'm actually struck by the amount of consensus on the basic premise of those documents. And I would submit that even the president's biggest detractors are not necessarily taking issue with the premise of his grand strategy as articulated by HR and Nadia. And luckily we have the work of insightful and clear-eyed scholars like Misha Oslin to thank for that, for waking us up to the challenge that we face from the Chinese Communist Party and the fact that we have a new direction in US foreign policy. And it's gonna take a long time for us to figure out how to navigate these, this new set of geopolitical challenges and all the different cross currents and the rocky shoals that we're gonna to have to navigate around for decades to come. So Misha, thank you for your work. HR and Nadia, thank you for your leadership. Uh, HR, thank you for not firing me over a decade ago as I was a precocious <laughs> second and first lieutenant. And uh, I'm really excited for this discussion and uh, I'm honored to be working on this with you in Congress. Hey Carson, thank you for, the, for those great introductory remarks.
to our viewers, you know, we, this couldn't come at a more important time because I think what's happening is what Congressman Gallagher has laid out, this wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, this approach. I, I think the PLA and, and Misha, uh, we, we're anxious to hear what your thoughts are on this, might be believing their own propaganda. And this might be one of the reasons, I think, why we're facing such a, a, dangerous, a, you know, a dangerous period now uh, across the Indo-Pacific. So for our viewers, what we're going to do now is we're going to go into a facilitated discussion led by Dr. Shadlow so we can draw uh, out, of, out, of, uh, out of Misha Oslin some of his, his insights uh, from these superb essays in, in, the, in the book. That facilitated discussion along with Congressman Gallagher will go on till about 45 minutes past the hour. In the meantime, please send me your questions and I'll be reading them as that discussion's going, try to synthesize those as best I can. In the final 15 minutes, I will pose uh, to, to, uh, to Dr. Oslin uh, some of your questions uh, from, from our viewers. So without further delay, thanks again, Mike, uh, Congressman Gallagher for those great uh, introductory remarks. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Shadlow. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and um, and it's great to be back with old friends. I thought I would start because I think that Congressman Gallagher needs to depart a little bit earlier. So Misha, if you don't mind, I thought I might direct a couple of questions to him, and then we'll turn to Misha. I do want to say, however, um, Mike, that you, you've proven my point. Years ago, I wrote an article about the importance of knowing how to fluidly recount movie lines and, and, and uh, plots, you know, to really make it in the national security and foreign policy field. And see, you've done it again. Now you go forward and you'll see how often that, that actually is important. Usually it's the godfather, but in this case. So, Mike, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, two, in the past couple months, you've been really busy at home writing a few uh, really great, interesting op-eds. One essentially um, talked about the problem of reciprocity in the U.S.-China relationship. I think at that point, you talked about how Twitter as a platform, uh, the CCP was using Twitter here in the United States as a platform, um, but there were rules and regulations that prevented its use in China itself. So could you talk a little bit about that theme of reciprocity? And then second, I'd like you to comment a little bit more about your more recent op-ed, which talked about the possible Cold War between the U.S. and China. There was some criticism of that. I think a couple days later, Bob Zellick uh, wrote a letter to the editor. He found the term uh, not helpful, and I thought it might be interesting to start a little bit um, with both the Cold War and the reciprocity point. Thanks. Uh, great. Yeah. And I, I don't want to consume uh, time that could better be spent listening to Misha, who is an actual regional specialist. But to take it to the Godfather, the Middle East is very much like Michael Corleone <laughs> and the Godfather. Every time I escape it, it pulls me back in. Um, but on the first question of reciprocity, uh, I, I, I recently did um, uh, an hour long interview with Bill Bishop, who I'm sure everyone uh, that's tuning into this knows as the publisher of, of the cynicism, which has become essential reading for people that pay attention to these issues in DC. And he really taught, said something that, that I think, think is true, that these platforms are absolutely essential to the CCP's ideological warfare strategy. I mean, that, that is, it is the water in which that strategy swims. And without it, that strategy would really have a tough time taking hold. And so what I suggested after seeing, you know, day in and day out, CCP apparatchiks go on Twitter and suggest conspiracy theories that often were being parroted by useful idiots in the American media, not to be too uncharitable. Um, I wrote a letter to uh, Jack Dorsey at Jack and with Senator Ben Sass and suggested that a, a simple rule, a fair rule, in my opinion, would be that for countries that deny their own citizens access to this platform, i.e. China, they should not be allowed to propagate conspiracy theories on the, that platform. I'm sure there are unintended consequences to that. I'm not thinking about this is an area that's very tricky. I know there's been a lot of conservative bashing of social media companies and suggestions that we should treat them like content publishers. I think it's a bit more complicated than that. But I just don't think we can sit idly by while all this disinformation is being openly injected into our democracy. I mean, we just went through a bruising debate for years about Russian disinformation leading up to an election. In some ways, this is more pernicious. And we're in the midst of an election right now. So I'd be open to Misha's thoughts on, on the way to kind of thread that needle uh, or HR's thoughts as well. Uh, as for a new Cold War, um, I'm open to a better analogy. Uh, I, I think Misha, in, in some of what you've written, you've been critical of that analogy. So I welcome the pushback. I guess my only point is that there's something in between hot war, particularly nuclear war, and 
status quo, doing nothing, right? We can call it gray zone warfare. You know, we could call it lukewarm warfare. Uh, I think the Cold War analogy is useful. One, because it clues us into certain similarities with the original Cold War, the need to reinvent a lot of the national security apparatuses that we built in the old Cold War, have a whole of society effort, uh, invest in research and development from a federal level, but also clues us into the many, many differences, right? Foremost among them, the fact that we were never economically intertwined with the Soviet Union like we are with uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And so, and also I just like Cold War history. Uh, as I referenced in the piece, uh, uh, Joseph McCarthy is buried in my district. He's from my district. I'm the second Marine intelligence officer from Wisconsin elected to Congress. And that may be a dubious distinction, but I think it should warn us that there, we can go overboard. Uh, but as long as we retain that capacity for self-correction, this is something we can win. And the final thing I'd say, I'm sorry to go on, is I can't help but think that the CCP goes on state TV every day and criticizes Cold War thinking and Cold War mentality and us of summoning the ghosts of McCarthyism because they don't want the new Cold War to end the way the old Cold War did, with we win and they lose. So I, I, rest, I rest my thoughts. Thanks, Mike. And that's actually a perfect opening history historian, Misha. So I'd love to turn to you now, the, um, the, the uh, featured guest of the day. So first, I, I loved your book. I, I, I would like to say that each of the essays is really elegantly crafted. And um, they're just, they're, they're perfect for both uh, those who are new to this subject, as well as experts as, as well. And Michael Howard, the, the famous historian who wrote about strategy, really would have been proud. I think that you're an example of, of what he was talking about. So let's start a little bit, Misha, um, just with the title of the book, Geopolitics. Um, tell us a little bit about what you mean by geopolitics, because it features so, you know, it, it's a theme that runs throughout the whole book. And I think it's important for the audience to understand a little bit what you mean and a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about Nicholas Spikeman as well, because he also features in several of the essays. And I think that forms a nice framework for understanding the rest of the chapters. Uh, thank you. I, I, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I, I realize now that the title of the book probably should have been Wolf Warrior Geopolitics. I, I don't know if we can <laughs> change it, but uh, that's, that's the problem with not asking Representative Gallagher for his thoughts on the title beforehand. Um, before I get to that, though, let, let me just give a, a, a few seconds of thanks. Um, thanks to the Hoover Institution for uh, allowing me to publish the book, uh, to, to go with the idea of a book of essays, which a lot of people don't like. Uh, Tom Gilligan, our director, who was very supportive of this. Chris Dower and his entire team who produced the book at Hoover Press. This is my third publisher, and, and honestly, this was the best experience I had publishing a book, and, and the book, I think, is just beautifully done as a, as a, as a piece. It's, it's nice to, to hold. Erin um, Wichter and her team, who's, who's putting the word out, I really appreciate it. Um, our colleague, Neil Ferguson, who kindly wrote uh, such an excellent foreword that put it into this context of, of, of where we are today, and I appreciate him taking time. And of course, all of you guys for, for coming on, and I know how busy busy you are, and Representative Gallagher, not only helping run the country, worried about very impending, wonderful family news that's gonna be coming. So everybody's busy, and I, I just am glad you took time. But I think we have to take time because it's, it's, it's important, and, and it's important in a way that those of us who've been doing Asia for decades have waited for. And now that it's here, it's a little bit like the, you know, the dog who catches the car. You know, you just, what, what do you do now? Because everyone is focused on it in a way that you were sort of a lonely voice in, in the wilderness. And, and one of the ways that it's helpful for me to think about it is this older concept of geopolitics. Um, it, uh, Representative Gallagher talked about the, the, uh, the water that the CCP swims in. Um, we used to swim in the water of geopolitics. You know, we used to think about it all the time in relation to, to our strategy, our goals, our desires for what the world should look like. And then at the end of the Cold War, we dropped it as just, just like we, we folded up you know, Strategic Air Command and said, okay, we don't need it anymore. I think part of it was the end of uh, history, that uh, the idea that we were at the end of history, uh, the idea that um, we didn't have to really think anymore about a, a global challenger and therefore different areas of the world. Uh, I think also some of it may have been related to things that both HR and, and uh, Mike Gallagher went through the revolution in military affairs where suddenly we thought, well, you know what, we can project power anywhere around the globe lethally with precision. We don't have to really think about geography. So there were confluences that made us forget why geography is important. I mean, geopolitics, and I, and I want to distinguish it from geostrategy, um, you know, it's very simple. It, it, it's the influence of geography on 
political and international relations, or conversely, how foreign policy interacts in, in a geographic space. Um, I think when, when you think about China, th there's no other way than to understand that they are looking at the world geopolitically. You know, we're, we're very used to talking about one belt and one road, or the first and second island chains. Now, those are geopolitical conceptions for the Chinese, but the way they're, they're uh, approaching it is through a geo strategy. And I know it, it's clunky and I'm not a huge fan of it, but that's a, it's an important distinction to make. I think these days, sometimes we talk about geopolitics as though that's what IR is, you know, that's just foreign policy is geopolitics. Well, geopolitics is not necessarily what you do at the UN or at the Hague, but when you think about uh, access to resources, when you think about lines of communication, when you think about linking different parts of the world together to benefit your own national power, you're trying to affect power through the geographic space and you do it through a geo strategy. So for those of us on this side of thinking about policy, we should be thinking about it in those terms. The one belt, one road is a geo strategy. I found, and I'll, I'll wrap up here on this question, I, I found the thinker, obviously this starts with Halford Mackinder, the Germans gave it a bad name and they, there's, a, there's a long history there. I found Nicholas Spikeman, who was a Yale um, uh, his, uh, historian, political scientist, a geopolitician, whatever you want to call him, who unfortunately died during the war, died very young, but wrote a couple of just incredibly insightful studies on, on where geopolitical competition played out. And unlike Mackinder, who, who later came to Spikeman's, uh, to Spikeman's way of thinking, as opposed to thinking about that heartland, that gigantic steppe area in, in the, you know, the center of Russia and parts of China, he talked about the rimlands. And that's really where this plays out. It plays out in the inner seas, whether it's the Mediterranean or the English Channel, or in the case of Asia, the East China Sea and the, the South China Sea. It's where the people are and, and the, um, the, the productive facilities are. And so that's where competition really happens. It doesn't happen out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean except if you're trying to take a place that gives you like midway, that gives you access. Instead, it's competing in, in the rimlands. And, and Spikeman, I think, really helps us understand what Beijing has been trying to do for the past 20 years in terms of securing what in the book I call the Asiatic Mediterranean, the integrated strategic space that's the, the, um, the Sea of Japan, the East China Sea, South China Sea, all the way into the Indian Ocean. And so I think it behooves us to understand what the Chinese think about geopolitics in order for us to have the right geo strategy. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I was actually next going to ask you a little bit to expand upon the concept of the Asiatic Mediterranean, what actually is happening there, maybe uh, over the past few years in terms of some of the developments. And then if you could also link that a little bit to the broader concept of the Indo-Pacific and how it fits in, because that's also another important theme of the book. But tell us a little bit about what's happening in the Asiatic Mediterranean developments um, that you think are important and for us to continue to watch. Well, this was actually a term used by Spikeman uh, in 1942 uh, in his last book, um, the, the, I think the Structure of World Politics. I'm just blanking on, on the name. It was unfinished at the time of his death and then uh, finished by his colleagues. Um, and he said, look, let's think about Asia's inter interconnected seas the way we think about the Mediterranean. All of the great powers are ranged around them. It is the lifeline into and out of the region. So if you think of the East China Sea and the South China Sea and Taiwan, that sits at the neck basically between the two of those. It goes down, it flows seamlessly actually from uh, what we used to call Asiatic Russia, Siberia, down into what are the most productive areas. If you think of Japan, South Korea, and China, and the northern part of China, these are the most productive parts of, of the world economy in terms of, of production. And then from there, uh, or into there, all the raw materials flow, and out of there, all of these finished goods flow. Um, but we, we don't really think of it, uh, we, we think of, because they have different geographic names, we think of them as a sea separated from another sea. It's certainly not how the Asians think of it, nor do they think of it as separated from the Indian Ocean. Now, you, you get to the Indian Ocean different ways. You can get to it through the Strait of Malacca, you can get to it through the Strait of Sunda, but then you flow directly into the Andaman Sea, and then the in the Indian Ocean. And that, of course, leads to the part of the world we're more familiar thinking about. So to them, it's an integrated space. It's an integrated strategic and, and battle space. It's why, for example, the Chinese, a term that I, I don't think we use much anymore, we did about a decade ago, they were building a string of pearls um, 
and that was to flow. HR just reminded me. Thank you. It's the geography of the piece is the last is the last book um, that he wrote. And really, people should pick it up. It's it's just it's it's just lucidly written and 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 helps you understand why you need to to have a forward defense because you don't want to be contained in either your hemisphere or worse your quarter sphere. You need. A, a, a global defense, and you need to think about it integrated. Um, it's why the Chinese are building uh, bases in Djibouti. It's why they're building uh, access points in Gwadar, in Pakistan, or in Burma, to allow them to have strategic space to flow from the, the productive neighborhood that they're in all the way into where, where these goods go. And then if you look at what is sometimes called the Maritime Silk Road, uh, a component of, of the land-based one belt, one road, the Maritime Silk Road follows, or the bases follow the road. The road follows the bases, the bases follow the road. It's either flag following trade or the other way around. But they're creating access points. It's why the Indians are so concerned, why the largest naval procurers over this decade are, is going to be the Indian Navy, because they're very concerned about maintaining access. It's why the Japanese are building, because no one wants to have their strategic space um, shrunk to where they are not able to enter the global commons. We've been so used to operating in the global commons as essentially an island nation, a continental island nation, that we, we've lost the sense that it, it can be cut off from us. For 70 years, we haven't had to think about it. We have to think about it now. It's certainly why when you and HR were writing the national security strategy, so many of us thought you had it exactly right, that the competition which is a sort of you know theoretical concept. Well, what are they competing at? This is how they're competing. They're competing in space, and we have to understand that in order to be able to maintain the freedom and the free and open Pacific, a concept that for us goes back, by the way, to the 19th century, a free and open Pacific and Indo-Pacific, uh, just as we've maintained our ability to get from the continental U US into maritime Asia. I think it's a nice segue to the concept of the Indo-Pacific, which was a, a concept that was introduced in the national security strategy, but also had been talked about for many years by, by others as well. And I think also I'd like Mike to comment a little bit on the Hills perspective on it, because I think it is an area of consensus um, uh, among, you know, in terms of the term and, and what it means. And also at HR, if you have any thoughts about the Indo-Pacific as well, uh, and how maybe also what's happening, um, you know, more recently in terms of the way the administration is thinking, whether how implementation is going, these are the strategy. Um, so Mike, Mike uh, Misha, do you want to just briefly comment on that and I'll turn to Mike Gallagher. Yeah, very briefly. I'm, I'm just happy we're talking about the Indo-Pacific, period. You know, when, when, when I taught at Yale or studied, you know, you would be in the Department of East Asian Studies, right? And, and on, uh, in uh, the State Department, you have the East Asian and Pacific Affairs. But, but the Asians don't think about it in that way. You know, India's look east, act east policy or Japan's uh, quasi-alliance with India. It is, it is all integrated. And so we need to catch up. Uh, DOD gets it right with uh, the uh, Asian, uh, you know, the, the area of responsibility for Indo-Pacific Command is exactly right. It, it, it encompasses the entire region. So we're getting there. I think we need to get the rest of government and academia and, and the, the thought places to also work at it in an integrated way. But that's come a long way since, you know, I started doing this, you know, 15, 20 years ago. I, at least from the hill, I don't think there's anyone who's questioning the uh, the renaming of PACOM, nor the overall prioritization, geographic prioritization that it represents. Uh, I do, however, think, and this is not just true in Congress or, or, or acutely true in Congress, but I think br more broadly in the think tank community, uh, I certainly sense a lack of focus on India. Uh, and I don't think there, while we have a, a growing number of China-focused scholars, uh, I think that's an area where uh, neither members of Congress nor the broader foreign policy community have chosen to focus on and write extensively about, with some notable, notable exceptions, of course. And then I think more broadly, just as it pertains to the work of the national security strategy and the respect for the Eurasian rimland that Misha brilliantly lays out, uh, I think while uh, recent polling suggests that Americans in the wake of coronavirus have an unusually negative view of China in general, and even Canadians, by the way, once you've pissed off the Canadians, you know you've really screwed up. Uh, I, I don't think it's a palpable sense 
of clear and present danger that would allow us to make the necessary military intelligence and economic investments I think we need to make in the Pacific. In other words, I think people in my district in Northeast Wisconsin felt the threat of Salafi jihadist terrorism in 2015 and 2016 in a way where they don't feel the threat of the Chinese Communist Party because it's, it, it's more insidious and it's, it's different. And, and, and uh, I think that's true even after coronavirus. So I think we all have to do a better job of explaining why we don't want to live in a world in which they're even allowed to be a regional hegemon, where you know, an Asia for Asians displaces the US as the dominant Indo-Pacific power. And that's a harder case to make at a time when there are people in both parties that are embracing, quite frankly, a more isolationist view and don't understand how hard it would be to move across the Pacific to get to the fight in ways that Misha does understand and his book brilliantly lays out. HR, did you want to make any comments till now or? No, no I, I think I'll just pass and, and I'm, I'm uh, sort of synthesizing the questions from, we have some great questions from our okay. viewers. All right. All right. I'll ask, I'll ask a few more and then open it up to viewers because I know really that's, that's what it's about. But I just would like to highlight that I should have done this early on. The book is actually more than just about China. There's a really interesting, interesting two chapters on Japan. Misha is also really a historian of, of the region, has written um, about Japan for many years. One of the chapters had a very interesting description of how Japan managed to balance um, the problems of globalization, both the opportunities afforded by it, as well as some of the drawbacks. Um, and I think you very, uh, you clearly explained how Japan balanced between the two and asked whether or not those lessons had some relevance for us today. So Misha, would you like to comment a little bit about that? I thought that was a great chapter. Thanks. Um, yeah, the chapter, that essay is called The Eightfold Fence, and it comes from an ancient, Jap one of the oldest Japanese poems that talks about how the gods set up uh, eight fences around Japan to keep it safe from the world so that it would be a, it would always be a divine land. And, you know, in many ways, we have an exoticized image of Japan that it has always been separated from the world, uh, which is certainly not true. Uh, but at the same time, Japan has clearly maintained barriers to the world that most of us in the West would find um, questionable, if not problematic. But I wrote the book because honestly, um, I, you know, I lived in Japan in, in the, the 90s uh, and parts of the 2000s, and you get very used to it. But then I was back there, and I was actually there uh, during the, the, the terrible Paris massacre in 2015, I think it was. Uh, and I was in, in Tokyo, and, and all the news is coming in. And so immediately, as a, as a um, as, a, uh, as someone who lives in America, I, I, you, you, your body reacts physically, and my body reacted physically that, my God, here's another attack. What's, what's next? What do I have to worry about? What should I do? And then I realized I'm in, I'm in Tokyo. I'm, I'm perfectly safe. Japan obviously had an instance of domestic terrorism back in the mid-90s, but the type of terrorism that we had been dealing with for, at that point, 15 years in its post 9-11 iteration, but for, for decades, I realized Japan didn't have to worry about. Now, they live in a dangerous neighborhood. They have to worry about North Korea. They have to worry about China. But a lot of the things that have consumed us, and then I was looking at what was happening in Europe in terms of immigration and uh, assimilation and the question of open borders and the like, Japan has a different set of answers. And so out of that flowed this essay to try to understand uh, in a very broad sense Japan's choices and whether they might not be better than we gave them credit for. Uh, and very simply, after the popping of the Japanese bubble in 1989, we all lost interest in Japan. It wasn't going to make us rich, so we didn't care about it. And quite frankly, it's exactly what will happen when China's bubble pops. We'll just, we'll just forget about China. It'll be big, but it won't be a way for us to get rich. And, and we thought we had, you know, we had the go-go 2000s and the go-go 90s and so on and so forth, and Japan seems stagnant. And yet by any metric, Japan does extraordinarily well whether it's a crime metric, whether it's a health metric, whether it's a, um, uh, it's a uh, social stability metric, uh, education metric, it has enormous problems, and, and I recognize that, but it made choices that we said meant it really wasn't very modern and, and it wasn't opening up and, and completely open borders or uh, complete integration with the world. And, and I questioned whether in 100 years we might look back and say, you know what, they may have made choices that certainly were as legitimate and possibly better than ours. It was meant to be a controversial chapter, but I do think that I will just simply end this by saying that when I travel through Asia, everyone knows that money can be made in China. 
but the place that everyone aspires to be is Japan. Clean skies, green parks, safe population that supports its government. They all want it to be Japanese. None of them want it to be Chinese. And we should at least be aware of that. Thanks, Mike. I'll ask one last question about one of the most interesting chapters on North Korea. It's interesting because it's not um, a line of, of uh, discussion that we often hear. So essentially, I'll summarize very quickly. Uh, you argue that we should be more realistic about uh, the dangers North Korea poses in terms of potential accidents involving nuclear materials and nuclear components and weapons, and that we should actually consider working with them on safety issues. And I think yeah. that that's interesting. I don't think a lot of people talk about that. Uh, so yeah. why don't you comment a little bit about that? And when you wrote that chapter, I forget the, the date when the original version came out. Did you get pushback? Um, what was the response to that? Uh, so now I'm, I'm breaking out in a sweat because I'm, I'm nervous oh, about sorry. HR coming down on me oh. no, I, because I know it was- <laughs> We it were was, hoping we wouldn't notice the chapter. <laughs> it was, it was it, no, it was, it was meant to be controversial and I did get a lot of pushback, um, but then I also got weird invitations uh, from people who had never invited me before. Um, the, here's where I went, you just sort of like got my Cold War geek on. I know, Mike's, you know Mike wrote a whole dissertation on uh, strategic adaptation in the Cold War, and I've never gone that deep. But I've always been very interested in, in the nuclear question. You know, have, going to college in DC in the 80s, it was a, it was a big topic. Um, and it seemed to me that the real issue with North Korea, because I see them as very rational actors that, that you know, dance up to the line of craziness, but really never cross it, um, is not that they're going to wake up one day, whether it's Kim Jong-un or, or his sister or whoever it is, and decide I'm going to nuke uh, San Francisco. It's that there's going to be an accident. And we had dozens of accidents. We had uh, a Titan II missile blow up in Arkansas and a, a fully loaded uh, with a nuclear warhead and blow the warhead hundreds of meters away. We had planes crash. We, we don't know where six of our nuclear weapons are. They disappeared during accidents in the Cold War, most of them oddly off of the Carolinas coast. So there may be a sort of, you know, Bermuda Triangle thing going on. But anyway, you know, accidents all the time. Chelyabinsk in the Soviet Union, uh, an explosion to this day, we don't know how damaging it was. My worry, and we spend billions and billions of dollars on nuclear surety, what, what they call the nuclear enterprise, nuclear safety. And so I was able to interview former commanders of strategic command and, and people actually all the way down to, to uh, missileers and, and subcap, ballistic missile subcaptains. And um, th they talk about, look, the, the main job is keeping it safe. So my fear is that how do we know that North Korea is going to keep it safe? We don't know the design of their weapons. We don't know uh, that they, whether they have permissive action leaks, links. We don't know who has authority to launch. We don't know if it's going to be delegated in case of a decapitation attack. We don't know how they're going to send the messages. What, what if the phone lines get cut and someone says, oh my God, they, they must have destroyed Pyongyang, let me launch. We don't know their early warning. Two of the episodes I talk about in the chapter uh, are how close we almost came to nuclear war with the Russians, uh, once with the Soviets, once with the Russians, uh, where malfunctions, uh, well, not malfunctions, misreading of sensor data from satellites led the Russians to believe that we were launching missiles. And it was only because humans intervened and said, no, this doesn't make sense, that they didn't launch. Um, Stanislav Petrov, who just died uh, back in the in '83, and then uh, under Boris Yeltsin. Um, so we have no idea if, if, and they don't have satellites in in the in North Korea. So what happens if they see a B-52 circling and they say that's it? My point was that my fear is that having a safe nuclear arsenal is so difficult that if, and I say if, we don't denuclearize them, which I know was was a it has been a core goal of all administrations, but if we don't nuclearize, denuclearize them, if we live in a world with North Korean nuclear weapons, how do we keep them safe? That's a key thing. Deterrence is part of it. I get it. You know, you've, you, you, they will go if they, make us, if they make us do it. I get that. But what about the accident that, that where a missile can launch or it can blow up and they'll blame us? So crazily, it's a question of, you know, do we, do we try to help in some odd way? If they have them, I don't think they'll let us help, and I don't think they'll let the Chinese help. But if it's a world where our kids are going to live under a North Korean nuclear shadow to some degree, how do we think a little bit differently? And so it was meant, again, to be a, a provocative chapter, but one that goes through all of the Cold War history about how it's really hard to keep these things safe. And we've done an extraordinary job, but with incredible, incredible work at it. And I just don't know, none of us know 
if the North Koreans will do the same. Well, I'll let Congressman Gallagher one minute on that, and then I'm going to turn to HR for the questions, only because you're nodding, and I can't tell if you're nodding as if Misha's crazy or Misha's right. <laughs> both, both. You know, uh, I agree emphatically with everything you said, and I don't have much to add other than I do, I do think, um, you know, the, the, at least on the Hill, I think most people welcome the policy of maximum pressure with North Korea. And I think most people, even those of us on the sort of the hawkish side of the spectrum, were willing to test uh, this diplomatic outreach. However, I think it's fair to say that we, we've kind of taken two steps forward, one step back in terms of our North Korea policy. I think there's a lot of us, myself included, who believe there's more we can do to impose pressure, particularly when it comes to Chinese banks and businesses that give an economic lifeline to North Korea. And I, just to relate it to Misha's broader work, I think you know a lot of times the people that are advocating a, re a return to the status quo ante or saying we're going overboard in terms of a more confrontational approach to China, will cite a variety of areas where we can cooperate and stability on the Korean Peninsula is one of them. However, I think uh, people like Peter Mattis, the most influential Mattis, has done a very good job of systematically dismantling that argument and showing, and even on the, 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 own, the terms of that uh, argument, it, it's failed because the Chinese Communist Party has not proved a cooperative partner. And so uh, I really think, uh, you know, North Korea policy is something that we've been content to just sort of praise maximum pressure, but ignore some of the disconfirming bits of evidence we've gotten in recent months. Thanks. Okay, now to the audience. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for hanging in with us. And uh, HR, the floor is yours. Hey, hey thanks. What a, what a great discussion. So what I've done, Misha, just to give you a heads up, I've, I've grouped these into kind of seven questions, and they're going to be rapid fire. So <laughs> wow. get ready. Okay, all right. All right. Um, and we have a great international audience here, and you're asking just wonderful questions. Thanks to everybody. So from Greg, John, Dylan, Guofo, Matthew, and David, though, the, their questions were about what about these flashpoints now that we're seeing in the South China Sea, along the Indian border, with the extinguishment of, of freedom, uh, attempt to extinguish all human uh, rights and, and individual rights and freedom of speech in, in Hong Kong, uh, the threats against Taiwan and the Senkakus, What's happening and why? What is China trying to achieve? Uh, is, are, is this new aggressiveness connected to the COVID crisis? How do you see what China's trying to do along, along these flashpoints? Um, and, uh, and, and what do you think the prospects are going forward? Huge, you know, it's a huge question. Um, at some points I sort of hesitate um, because I'm getting back more into historian mode than, than you know, pundit mode and, and trying to look forward. I think it's important to, to go backwards in a sense and say, you know, why, why did we get here when this was obviously the point that we didn't think we would get to? Uh, and we're, and we're conf not conflating, but we're combining things that are domestic that are going on in, in China with the party with, with again, it's, it's, it's geo strategy, what it's doing on the outside. And again, how it sees things like Taiwan and sees things like Hong Kong. Um, what's clear is that the stronger that Beijing has become, the more assertive and aggressive it's become. Now, w the interpretation is, you know, why? Why is that? Is it doing it out of confidence or doing it out of insecurity? And I, th I think it's a little bit of both. We can't forget that it is, you know, always the strongest country in Asia. It, it always has to be um, just by nature of its own geography. Um, but it also understands that it faces very strong uh, neighbors and it faces strong partners slash adversaries such as the United States. And so I think there's an element where it feels that it can bully smaller nations. It, 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 you know, it's too easy to say that it did that historically, but it is certainly in the, the mindset and the DNA uh, of the Chinese bureaucratic state that this is how international relations were ordered. And yet it's also a party and a Leninist party state that knows that it does not have much legitimacy uh, even at home, uh, particularly with the economic slowdown, that it faces enormous pressures going forward, whether it's a, a slowing down macro economy, uh, the fact that Beijing is back under lockdown because of the, the coronavirus, uh, that it did not handle that uh, as well as it led the world to believe, uh, that pollution is terrible. I can go through all this. That's a little bit what I tried to talk about in my last book, you know, were the, were the risks and stresses within Asia. Um, and so, does it feel that it needs to act now because it cannot act in 10 years the way that it wants? And we saw that with Japan in the 1930s. It felt it needed to act then as opposed to wait because time was not on its side. And I think 
that there's an odd combination in Beijing of feeling so much stronger than anyone else around it, you know, given where, where it's come in the past, uh, you know, the past uh, two decades or so, but at the same time, not knowing if in two decades hence, it, it will act. Now, there's, some of these are very historical, right? What we're seeing, I mean, 20 Indian soldiers uh, being killed in a clash with uh, the Chinese just over the past couple of days. These are border disputes back from the 19th century. So they're, they're played out in a, in, a modern, uh, in, in a modern setting, but they certainly didn't develop just because uh, suddenly China's strong. These go back for centuries. It goes back to the Qing dynasty. And of course, 50 years ago, over 50 years ago, nearly 60 was the border war between China and India. So that's 60 years ago. So think if Japan and the United States were still fighting, skirmishing over World War II, in 2000, that's 1940 plus 60 is 2000. That's where they are with India and China. They haven't settled the borders. What's clear is that no one has settled the problems. And I think that's the biggest reason we have the flashpoints. Asia cannot figure out how to get past these things, whether it's the South China Sea, East China Sea, borders uh, on land. Um, it's not just China, uh, it's, it's Japan and Russia, it's uh, Cambodia and, and, Th and Thailand. I mean, it's, it's a whole bunch of different nations. But clearly, it's the assertiveness of, of the party's desire to be seen again as a hegemon, clearly as the hegemon in Asia that has driven so much of this. And the concern is that eventually flashpoints can, can just multiply. You can lose control of a situation. Ultimately, that's the scenario I talk about in the, the war chapter, a uh, future history of a war between China and the United States. But we should be very worried, not that the region will go to war tomorrow, we should be very worried that after decades of economic growth and political integration, it has even more interstate conflicts than it did before. They have not solved it. That is a bad data point for us to be looking at. You're, you're already starting to address some of the questions from our, from our, our other viewers. So Ed, Joshua, Felix, and Lawrence, really, were at, and Rana, had questions about what is driving this from an emotional uh, perspective from an aspirational perspective, this kind of behavior from the Chinese Communist Party, what does China really want broadly? What does what is this agenda of national rejuvenation? How do you see it? Lawrence, who's who's, who's listening in, watching from Berlin, said, "Is this a modern day version of of Laban's realm? You know, what what is China really hoping to achieve, and and what is driving it uh, in this agenda of national rejuvenation?" Again, these are, these are extraordinarily important and hard questions. And I know that um, uh, Rana Mitter, the eminent uh, Chinese historian uh, from Oxford, is, is online and asked one of those questions. So I'm always, I'm hesitant. I'd like to punt, but I don't think I can. Um, and I don't want to make it too easy, but I, 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 do, think, I do think it's important to, to listen to what the, the party state says. Um, we spend a lot of time interpreting it from our own views, um, but the party state is, is fairly voluble if not always transparent in, in the goals that it has, whether it's Xi Jinping thought uh, on foreign affairs and diplomacy or uh, things like document number nine, uh, the, the infamous now document number nine, which is, talks about um, uh, in basically the ideological war between, between uh, China and the West. Um, I think it's fair to say that the party wants to survive. It wants to remain in power. And, and everything flows from that. And, and that can either be from a sense of, of pressure or from a sense of advantage, but, but that this is about maintaining the party and therefore the strength of China so that, that China supports the party, if, if I can put it that, that crudely, uh, that, that it is legitimacy and that it is um, both, it's fulfilling the part of the social contract that was we will give economic growth again, for, for no political reform, the reverse of what the Soviets tried, uh, it has been in many ways, although not fully fulfilled by China over the past generation. Um, the, the second part about returning China to a position of greatness in Asia and by extension the world um, is where I think the party's working now. Um, so there is, and it's what rising, it's what rising powers do. I think there's a really interesting debate now over the question of, does China want to supplant the post-World War II order? Does it just want to get rid of it and put in its own? Or does it want to co-opt it? Does it, does it actually want to take it over for, it, for itself in a way? Uh, you see it building analogous structures to things that, that were built by the West, such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the One Belt, One Road itself. 
Um, but uh, in Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you can go back to look at things that the, that the, the party state has put together. Um, but I think it's fair to say that it, it sees itself as a great power. It's hard not to. And because of that, it is acting uh, in ways to maximize that power or, or express that power. It, it often does so peacefully. It does so through diplomatic fora, and then sometimes those turn testy. Uh, it does so through um, it, trying to get economic advantage and, and, and diplomatic advantage. But there is always the question of hierarchy. And we talked about reciprocity between the United States and China, which I actually think is sort of the key U.S. policy now. And I think it's the right U.S. policy, which you guys call principled realism and, and how you then see that uh, played out in, in policy. But from China, it, it, is, it is actually hierarchy. It's returning to a more, a quote unquote, natural state of hierarchy. What, um, what uh, the, the Tsinghua um, Professor Daniel Bell in a new book calls just hierarchy. And talk, they talk about just hierarchy between states. There are big states and there are small states. There's always going to be that. So the question is, from the Chinese perspective, um, at least from a Confucian perspective, how do you act responsibly in that hierarchical relationship without trying to pretend that it's equal? Not Westphalian. And I think that's what the party uh, is, is attempting to do. Is it Lebensraum? In a certain sense, it's Lebensraum not in taking over territory that it believes is rightfully it, such as Taiwan or, uh, or, or maintaining territory that is strategically crucial like Xinjiang uh, and Tibet. Um, but it is strategic space. I think that's the best way to put it. That's why you see a PLA Navy. And let's, let's be honest, they've achieved most of their goals already of, of turning the inner seas into free, free operating zones for what, what 30 years ago was basically a coastal force. It's an extraordinary development in a very short period of time. And because of that, it is forcing the other states in the region to accept these, this unequal structure. And then we're coming in orthogonally with a different model. It, it's a, it's it, not the vertical model, it's the horizontal model. It's that these states are sovereign and they need to be treated equally and we're gonna have equal alliances even if we have more, more capability and capacity than them. So you basically have the clashing of, of literally almost in a, in a spatial sense, two different models. You know, I'm thinking about the term one belt, one road, which was kind of uh, revealing when, when the Chinese Communist Party rolled it out and then backed off of it after mm -hmm. President Trump made a, a speech in which he said, hey, there have to be many belts and many roads. Right. right? And, and so, uh, so it, it is- They're just it, all Chinese, that's it. <laughs> it just sort of broke <laughs> this idea of a, a modern day tributary system. Hey, just coming back to the, to, the, to the US and really the multinational response on this, we had a lot of questions about, okay, first, like what took us so long is what Felix wanted to ask. And was it, was it business avarice? Why, why didn't we see the threat from the Chinese Communist Party earlier and adapt to it. Uh, Tevi asked a question about Chinese information warfare and said, hey, this gets to your point about reciprocity, right? How come they do wolf warrior diplomacy and we can't even have a Chinese villain in a US movie? So this gets to influence over, over Hollywood in connection uh, with, with Chinese influence operations here in the United States. Great report on this, by the way, that, that Hoover did about a year ago. And I should make a plug right now for a wonderful Hoover program that Misha is, is integral to, which is on, on China sharp power uh, that, that Larry Diamond and others are, are working on as well here at, at Hoover. And then Zach had a question. He said, hey, uh, you know, back in the day, we had the US Information Agency, right? And, and so I guess the question is, why did it take us so long? And wh why, why are, are we, do we seem not to be adapting to the information dimension of this? And, and, and do you have any ideas about, about how to respond uh, to, the, to the party's effort to influence us uh, in such a way that we don't respond effectively uh, to these various forms of aggression. I know we're getting down to the last minutes, and this is such an important and wonderful question. I would say just in terms of the book, I try to address a lot of this in the chapter called The New China Rules, which honestly, I probably should have called The New Beijing Rules, but The China Rules was you know, more mellifluous. So I used that, but um, I tried to get into that. You're absolutely right. The report that our colleague Larry Diamond did on uh, Chinese influence operations is a touchstone, and I think everybody needs to read it. You can get it on the Hoover site. Uh, Larry's continuing that work, HR. Uh, is central to it as well uh, in, in terms of Taiwan and the sharp power because the, the, we really have woken up to it. Now, I, I want to be an optimist. I was, it's a gray day here in D.C. It's raining, in fact, but I want to be optimistic. And the optimism is that 
we, it took us so long to get it right because, because we really were, were hopeful that this was going to work out well. Our hearts were in the right place, honestly, that as a nation, we thought we were going to bring China into the, in the post Mao China, into the world of uh, the community of nations, that we'd get involved in all these international organizations, we'd help it develop and become wealthier, and it would see the benefits of all of this. And I think Beijing fully understands the benefits of all of it. It just is unhappy with a more subordinate position within that. Uh, and, and I believe that the, the party uh, is very serious about saying that it is not going to modernize. We certainly see that under Xi Jinping, modernize in terms of liberalize. It is not going to let in Western influences, is not going to let in concepts of, of uh, you know, democratic equality and, and the like, because that is, is existential for the party. But we, we're wedded to a historical concept that all nations that become part of the world and, and benefit from it will liberalize in some way. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna be having elections like in Peoria, but they will liberalize in some way. And, and certainly they will act in cooperative ways abroad. And that's being tested. There is a lot of self-interest though. I do think we really have to look at the role of corporate America more carefully, but this goes back to the very beginning of American relations with China. When the first American sailor was arrested by Qing authorities for a crime that he did not commit, and the merchant community, this is in 1821, the Terra Nova case, the merchant community said, take them, we don't care, because you told us you're gonna, you're, gonna cut, you're gonna cut trade relations if we don't give you this guy, take him, and they took him and they executed him. This goes all the way back to the self-interest. Now, what I think is that we've learned that that self-interest comes at an enormous price billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars every year stolen in intellectual property, terabytes of proprietary information taken that we will never, never get back. Um, the the, the self-interest now should shift to understand how to protect yourself. Same thing with the information space. Um, we let the, Confu we had 600 Confucius Institutes around the United States in one form or another, and there were only 20 American centers that were very soon shut down. It, is, it was unequal. And by the way, in Confucianism, reciprocity is actually considered the ultimate virtue. It's the golden rule. And they actually say in the Analects, treat others as you want to be treated. It's, it's almost word for word from the golden rule. Uh, so it, it's not our idea that you should act recipro reciprocally and equally and treat others equally with equal access or equal rights. It's a Confucian idea from 2,500 years ago. The party doesn't want to do that. But it is something that... I think should be guiding us as we understand now that our hopes for the last 40 years, this is where I'll wind up with a historical point, our hopes for the last 40 years were in some ways fulfilled of a China that is part of the world and much stronger and, and wealthier than it was and important to our economy, but the deeper hopes were not fulfilled. And we have to understand that we're not going back into that first period of hoping that it'll change. It has told us where it's going and what it wants to do. And the time for us now is to become realistic and to have a policy and a set of policies that works with all of our friends in Asia, and Asia is much bigger than just China, in order to, to protect our interests and then put us on a road where hopefully at some point in time, Beijing will understand that the course that it's chosen may in the short run be successful, but in the long run will alienate, isolate, and impoverish it. Well, I can't think of a better way to, to end the, just the question and answer period, but I'm going to ask you to, to maybe make some closing remarks after Nadia. I do want to sum up, though, just some of the questions, and and because I think you just responded to some of them. I mean, I, I think that that Nick and Chris uh, and Shelley were all asking about what are the what are the weaknesses? You know, is is the aggressiveness of the party is it swinging back? You know, swinging back against them? And I think Nadia, the point that you've made frequently is that, you know, competing with China doesn't foreclose on cooperation, which gets to your point, I think, uh, that, that you just made as well, Misha. And the, 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 rest, the rest of the questions, uh, I would say from, you know, from, from Nick and, and about, uh, about, um, about is our Navy ready? Uh, and then the questions from others about what about our allies in the region? Are they doing their part? I mean, I think, I think Misha, your chapter on US, Japan, and China together, that is a wonderful chapter. I highly recommend uh, that, that chapter to Peter and Clarence and Joshua and Michael and, and Jack who were asking about, about alliances. Uh, and, then, and then on the, on, is the Navy up to it or our allied navies up to it? Chapter eight, Misha, where you, you it's, I love it because you're a historian. So what you did is you, you act as if you're a historian looking back on, on, a future, on future events. And 
And so I recommend that chapter as well as how a confrontation could play out. And we're seeing some of these flashpoints really come to it to a higher level of prominence. But it's a wonderful book. Congratulations on it. And, and I just tell everybody, order, order it now. We just scratched the surface. Uh, and, uh, and what I'd like to do is turn it over to Nadia first. And, and, uh, and any final comments on Asia's new geopolitics, Nadia? And then we'll give Misha the last word here. I, I think we covered, you know, as much as we could in an hour. I wish we would have had more time. I would have uh, even brought up uh, some of the additional great parts of the book, the chapter on India as well, a really interesting chapter about the role of women in India. Uh, so I encourage the audience uh, to pick it up and to read it. Um, I, I don't have any, any more to add. I think we had had a longer time. I, I would have commented on the USIA question, the problem of information statecraft, which is how we need to be thinking on um, the role of allies and partners too in thinking about what we're facing. I think that's been an interesting shift over the past few months, a very probably COVID driven shift, but a very significant one I think as well. And so I think an idea for a future panel would actually be uh, to get some more Europeans and allies and partners from around the world, Australians, Japanese on this type of program uh, to hear from them. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. Misha, you have the final word. Yeah, I mean, again, there's there's so much that that we could cover, and and I, I think we 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 talked about a lot. I, I think the the good news is we've we're paying attention, uh, and I know Congressman Gallagher had to run to to do a, a hearing, um, but the work that he's doing, the Endless Frontier Bill to to uh, boost science and STEM and tech R and D here. Um, the, the new strategy that the White House put out, the strategic approach to the People's Republic of China, I encourage people to read. Uh, it starts with what you guys did in the national security strategy and then takes it to what is basically a, a position of reciprocity and says that's what's going to guide us. Um, you know, I think the Navy gets it. Um, and they understand it. They were warning about this years. I mean, I, you know, a decade and more ago going out and visiting what was then Pacific Command and is now Indo-Pacific Command, they'd be talking about uh, we're, we're losing blue space and water space and how do we, how do we react? So I think the pieces were there. Um, it's just they were in isolation and now they've sort of been drawn together. And the, the point is to have a strategy. I don't think what, whichever administration comes into office next January, uh, I think I think this is the new the new road, and it does not foreclose cooperation with China because we should be thinking about uh, China from a position of strength because we have enormous strengths that it does not have. It does have these weaknesses, and we have an an alliance, an unparalleled alliance network that China could only dream about. China's allies are North Korea and Pakistan. It doesn't have allies. We have allies, and so we need to work with those allies, especially Japan and Australia. We need to deepen that relationship with India. These are all easy things to say, and, and they're things we talk about a lot in the think tank world. Again, for the essays, I just wanted to get people to think a little bit differently. Uh, why, for example, the real competition, I think, in Asia is between China and Japan, not China and the United States, because that's an, an eternal one, in a sense. Um, what, is, what US strategy has been since the 19th century? We should be very proud that we've had a strategy of a free and open Indo-Pacific since the mid 19th century. It's not something new. People say we don't have strategy and we don't think strategically we do. And we've, we've thought that way for a very long time that we should be proud of that. Now conditions change. So the, so the, 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 the goals or the goal of a free and open Indo-Pacific hasn't changed since the 19th century. We need a strategy for it. So all of those things I try to, I try to touch on. Um, there's a lot to worry about. There's a lot that can go wrong, but I'm really heartened now. I'm heartened that people care, that, that, that you guys made it a priority, that Mike Gallagher's making it a priority. And uh, I think that as, you know, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, We'll always do the wrong thing until we do the right thing at the end. And I think we'll do the right thing at the end. And there's a lot to look forward to uh, going forward from a bipartisan approach as to how we're going to deal with China and the broader Indo-Pacific. So thank you all. Thanks so much for everyone who viewed and took time to watch and for, for you, HR and Nadia, taking time out of your, your schedule to join me for this. And I, I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks to you. And thanks to all of our viewers. Congressman Gallagher had to go do a vote. So he sends his best wishes to everybody and, and says thanks. Not a brilliant job facilitating. Thank you so much, Misha. And then for all of our viewers, go to the Hoover website for even more information about this and, and the many other challenges and opportunities that, that we're facing uh, during this COVID crisis and then going forward be, beyond that. So best wishes to all of you. I hope everybody stays well. Best to you and your families. 
and it's been a pleasure to have you here at the Hoover Institution. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.